The FujiCast is an independent loading zone production. I am fascinated, Kev, by uh, by prisons. I've never wanted to be in one professionally, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> uh, but uh, today's guest is uh, is a listener, Ryan Katsanis. And he had um, really great access to Alcatraz uh, because his Uncle Ray <laughs> used to work in the place. Mm-hmm. Not as a prison warder. Uh, because the prison closed down years and years and years and years ago. But, of course, it's a, it's a massive attraction to people. Yeah, Alcatraz. yeah, yeah. Have, yeah. You, have you, I mean, you've been to San Francisco. I've you? been to Alcatraz four times. Have you? Yeah, I love it there. Wow. I love all that stuff. I remember they had this guy, there was an ex-con there mm-hmm. called Whitey Thompson. God, he must have been really old. Who turned into a, a public, uh, an author. Right, who'd well, well, had been at Alcatraz. Yeah, right. and, and he was there signing his books and everything. No way. And you could have a little chat with him, and, I, and, and I, I went and spoke with him. And uh, and he he spelt my name wrong in the book. Well, you wouldn't argue. And he and he said to me, he said, oh, "Is that how you spell it?" And I went, "Yep, <laughs> that's absolutely fine." Well, I learned something about Alcatraz that it's. Um, um, do, do we talk about this in the interview? Oh, I'll mention it anyway. That it's it's kind of like a halfway house um, prison in that you you never uh, prisoners that went there had no sentence. No, as such. Yeah. They they went there because they were bad. Yeah, uh, they were the bad of the bad. Yeah, and so they went there to correct their badness, and then they would go back and complete their sentence. Yeah, at the the place from which they'd come. Yeah, a really yeah. fascinating place. Yeah, yeah. and they used it. to get the prisoners. They used to it was the only prison where you used to have hot showers. And the reason for that was that if they made them warm and comfortable with good food as well, they wouldn't dip. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't tempt uh, wouldn't be tempted to dip themselves in the cold waters around the island. Shark infested well, San Francisco s- Bay. Uh, so they say. The Fuji cast. Yeah, I, th- I think the shark bit. The sharks were further out, but I, I think Ryan covers that anyway to, today. So uh, anyway, welcome to the Fuji cast. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag, and of course also through the Fuji cast private Facebook group that you're welcome to become a part of. If you do want to send a mail in, send to click at fujicast.co.uk. If you're not a Fuji film shooter. It don't matter. You're still warmly welcome because the talk is very much also aimed at just being this thing we call a photographer. We've gone through the amateur and professional thing now a few times, whatever kind you are. Um, Thank you to our friends who have now been supporting us on Patreon, uh, which for the price of a coffee keeps the show growing, but most importantly, actually going. If you're one of the uh, the patrons, of course, uh, you'll uh, well, some of the, some of the, you know sometimes we we do the bumped to the front questions as well. Kev's book of the week. What have we got this week, Kev? Uh, this week we've got Vintage Eighties oh. London Street Photography by Johnny Stiletto. What a name, Johnny Stiletto. Johnny Stiletto. Couldn't get much more of a more no, London name. Could must you? have made up that name. Johnny Stiletto. Sounds yeah. like yeah, Johnny Stiletto. We'll get to that. Back to a black and white book. You got fed up with the colour one that you, you yeah. managed to bring out last week. About yeah. the, what was it last week? The, laundrettes. Um, uh, laundrettes, yes, that was right. Yeah. yeah. Back to black and white. Back to black. Um, there's uh, Kev's book of the week, yes, and um, uh, and yes, that's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> do you need it. any more? Yeah, what more do that's you want? That's enough. More? Uh, right, questions then. Are you starting? Or? Uh, yeah, I'll start. Why not? Uh, Stephen Lynham. Mm-hmm. Uh, hello, Neil and Kev. Hello, yada bl- he says, Yada blada. I wonder what you're going to say. Mm. Then. Two questions for you. The first is for Neil. Mm. My grandson is 15 years old and is a cornet. You don't player. look old enough to have a grandson who's 15 years old. No. What are you talking about? As all band and orchestra playing has ceased during lockdown, he's right. going to enter an online competition. Mm. This means he needs a microphone to plug into his laptop desktop to record his playing. Can you recommend one? Any suggestions? Gratefully received. Oh. Cornet. Cornet on the computer. Um, Jack used to play cornet because hmm. Sam played cornet in a band. And uh, we did try to record him a few times. Now, the trouble with uh, wind instrument, trouble with wind. The trouble I got with a clarinet. <laughs> I think it's I got wind. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you still play your clarinet? Yeah, I so occasionally get it out. Do you? Yeah. You're good at it? No. Can you, can you, oh, right. No. I wondered if you could still do any of the kids play um, an instrument. Rosa plays the guitar. Yeah. A bit. Oh, okay. Well. Uh, we we were reasonably musical for a little while, then uh, then the Xbox came along. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, so there's there's no playing the uh, there's no there's no Tommy Two Tone in in our house. Now. But, uh, Jack did used to play the cornet, and I uh, tried to record him a se- uh, several times with uh, just some basic Zoom recorders, uh, with limited success because of of course if the levels are, are high, aren't they? Mm. So using an auto level for a a, a wind instrument just doesn't work 
because every time um, that you go a little bit quieter in the room, it sucks all the ambient noise up and then pushes it back down again as the cornet starts. So um, there are a couple of microphones. I did look this up, actually, and I didn't want to give you bad info on this. And it seems that the... Um, and I, I actually I got lost down a rabbit hole of information on this one. You you use a blue mic, don't you? Blue snowball, don't you have? What's the? I know you got the blue yeti. Blue yeti. Yeah, the blue yeti came out best. Funnily enough, blue snowball uh, was one that was suggested. Blue yeti came out best, and you place it right in front of the bell. Apparently, don't put it to the side. Put it right in front of the bell, and <laughs> Bob's your uncle. Um, so uh, that was the one. But of course, that that's a USB mic. If you wanted to have a mic, this yeah, there's. there's Slightly more built for it. Perhaps you could, I mean, sure, um, make uh, the SM58, which is a stage microphone that a lot of musicians use. Don't they? Mm. They literally, this thing is indestructible. Mm. You can hammer nails in with it, almost. But there's one called a Shure SM57. Now, that's a reasonably low-priced mic when you look at some of the others that, uh, that are sort of twos and threes and four hundreds. And that's 88 quid is the lowest I could get it for. And uh, that would be a good one, but you will need some sort of. Con- do you use a converter when you go from your XLR? What do you use? Mine goes into a you Tascam go to a preamp. Don't a Tascam preamp. You? Yes. Well, uh, you can actually get a mic converter that's a preamp. That, that's a, it's called a Blue Icicle XLR to USB. Hmm. And if you get that little puppy, you can get yourself something like a Shaw, which I think would be a, a better microphone for it. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and good luck in the competition. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and Stephen also has a second question. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an answer Two for, for this. the price of one. I recently bought an X100V, which is great, but I still have my X100F, and I don't want to sell it, nor mm. do I want to give it away. No. I now use the X100V and never touch the X100F. Any ideas how I might set it up so I might be tempted to use it again? <laughs> well, this one's firmly ball past to you. Well, uh, it's not a technical question, is it? I would suggest perhaps, you know, with your X100F... Maybe, well, it depends if you want to uh, explore black and white photography, just have it permanently set to black and white. Oh, like I did with my... Like um, you did with your X-Pro1. X-Pro1, yeah, which is now my, my monochrome Fujifilm camera. Uh, yeah, or you could, if you you know, if you want to get a little bit uh, funky, you, you might tape up the LCD and, and have it always in optical viewfinder mode. So you're going to say spray it yellow. <laughs> a bit spray funky. it yellow. Spray it yellow. Well, you know, the the, Fuji, the uh, anniversary, the X100 anniversary is on. Yeah. The competition on the Fujifilm website. And if you enter, you, you have to send in a picture shot with an X100 of some yeah. sort. Yeah. You can win a limited edition X100, which I think is a different colour and is engraved. Didn't they used to reskin them or something? Yeah, the X-Pros, not yeah. the X-100s. All right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, why not do something like that? If you're never going to use it again otherwise, uh, you know, maybe force yourself to use the optical viewfinder, yeah. maybe set everything inside to black and white and 17-10 DCI ratios, you know, give yourself a different viewpoint, or maybe yeah. set it square so that it's it's always Instagram-sized, um, you know, whatever, if you're, if you're not using it much. Um, or you could just send it to us. <laughs> we'll put it on eBay for you. <laughs> yeah, could do with a dosh. <laughs> I must say that I know this isn't. Um, I mean, it's not an X100, but I must say uh, the vintage lens thing. I took it out to do some more shots, mm. and uh, I love it. I mean, because c- it's a totally manual procedure. Everything's changed to manual. Yeah, it's breathed a real sort of. It's been a breath of fresh air, actually. Using a camera in a totally manual setup, mm-hmm. um, and and treating it as my black and white, you know, mo- my monochrome as well, mm-hmm. uh, my affordable, my affordable Leica. I know th- there'll be people that go, "Oh, Neil, no," um, but uh, yeah, and I've absolutely adored it. Yeah. Get yourself a vintage lens and a converter, stick it on an X Pro One. Oh, you'll love it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you have got cameras kicking around that that are not being used for anything else, then, this had been you know. sitting in a in a, a display cabinet for ages. Great little camera. Just had to reset the date. Yep, and I was away. It's interesting seeing the menus again, isn't it? When you when you oh, do that. so old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But looking at I quite like them. Actually, I thought, oh look, this is good. So like, much bigger, much like easier dri- to read. Yeah, it was like driving. A vi- well, I keep my little vintage car here, <laughs> the one that I really want, the um, the Jensen Interceptor. Oh, if only. Jensen, you will be mine one day. Right, I'll, I'll try and bring him back, listeners. <laughs> okay, Neil, your go, your question. Is it? My, I've, all right, okay. Uh, Elias Camaratos, who's in a uh, lovely part of France, Bourgogne. Uh, hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. I recently started following the Fujicast, thanks to uh, Neil's plugging of it on the other podcast he hosts. 
Uh, oh, this sort of, um, I, I suppose last week we, we were talking about that review, but this is the other way around. Yeah. Needless to say, I enjoy your podcast immensely. Entertaining, informative, motivational and inspiring. And that's just Kev. I'm a professional photographer living in eastern France with my fledgling photography business, just getting off the ground when things went a bit south earlier this year. I guess you could say I'm one of the lucky ones because I have um, I had a full time job in the industry, which acted as a uh, in 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 an industry rather, which acted as a financial safety net. Although I've been uh, using Nikon, Nikon, Nikon full frame DSLR for my photography work, I have recently, thanks to you, been entertaining the thought of trying out a Fuji film. That's what happens when you listen to. Oh no, Kev. Influencers. Oh, God. We've become word. influencers. We are not influencers. We are not influencers. Have we smashed it? <laughs> <laughs> we are not influencers. Uh, the the <laughs> the one of you, at least, who's also an ambassador at said brand. <laughs> See, you're an influencer, Kev. Yeah. It's official. Elias says so. As I cannot financially afford at the moment to make a complete transition to a full kit, and also since due to er- ergonomic habituation... Thank you. <laughs> it would be a disaster to shift from one day to the next to a new system. I was wondering, is there anything you can suggest I could start with? Um, so there we go. Well, what would you... Uh, well, I, I, do you know what, Elias? I'm going to go back to... Uh, I, refer, I refer you to the previous comment from me anyway. Kev my, Kev's mileage is going to differ. But uh, I tell you what, you could could do no worse than an X-Pro one with a vintage lens. Really, you'll love it, mate. You'll love it. Yeah, although they're they're a bit more tricky to use than the, the, the modern moderner. Modern, cameras, eh? moderner cameras, what? but but yes, they are more. Uh, they will certainly be cheaper as well. Um, well how much you got, how much you think you pick an X Pro One up for these days? I really don't know. Wow, I really don't know. I mean, what, the second hand market for that camera yeah. will will go up as time goes by. I'm yeah. sure of it. Yeah. Um, While well, you're suggesting a cam, I'm going to look it up. Go on. So, what would you suggest? Yeah, I mean, again, it's one of those questions about budget, isn't it? And mm. you, obviously, we don't know what the budget is. So, you, you know, but I would, uh, if if this is something that you are thinking of using for your professional endeavours later on, then stay with one of the interchangeable lens cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, you could maybe go for a second-hand X-T3 or perhaps a X-T2, X-T30, XT20, that kind of thing. The XE range is an option also, but the XE range is more of a rangefinder style. So yeah. if you're used to using DSLRs, you might find the XT range more appropriate, yes. but you may not. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. Uh, one of the things that the UK do, and this might be something that Fujifilm France do also, is allow you to loan your uh, camera and some lenses for 48 hours i think you have to pay a deposit which you get back yeah but but uh you you know if you're if you're really interested in a particular combination then you know you potentially loan it yeah. as well surely a camera shop will hire it to you i'm sure yeah. um but yeah so that's i wouldn't go rushing straight into you know a set of xt4s and and all the lenses when you're still shooting with a, a different brand right now because it will it's a, it's a learning curve um, but once you start, uh, once you start, you'll never stop. <laughs> Sounds like an advert for a. Did you find one? Item. Did you find one? I did. Um, I found one on Wex, which probably won't be there now because uh, within a couple of days things change. Two hundred and twenty-two quid for an X Pro One. Well, in what condition is that? Uh, that was heavily. I mean, it said Kev condition. <laughs> but there's, there, there's yeah, there's a new. You've got good, con- excellent, good, fair, and Kev. <laughs> Actually, my they've X- renamed it. <laughs> my X Pro One is that is about the only cameras boxes I still have. Right, I have two camera boxes. You don't keep the boxes? No. What? Why would you keep the boxes? I have two camera boxes. My X Pro One mm. and my GFX One Hundred. Mm. They're the only ones I've kept the boxes for. And the X One, uh, the X Pro One. Um, Actually, no, that's not true. I'm thinking this is the cogs of my brain going round here. Right. I have three. <laughs> I have the original well, X one. Three brains. I have the original <laughs> X one hundred, the X Pro one, yeah. and the GFX one hundred. Right. Everything in between, I've thrown the boxes away. Oh dear. Yeah, because otherwise it looked like DHL collection box in my yeah. uh, collection room in my house. Um, <laughs> and and you know, I, I. But you always need a box, Kev. You've got kids; they need boxes for stuff. <laughs> we keep boxes. You can never in our house. We need a box. Come to me, there's one in the loft. Yeah, but look at the difference between your house and our house. You, you, your studio is as big as our house. <laughs> no, that's not true. That's not true at all. Uh, anyway, so I'll get rid of the boxes. But, they are in the West Wing, that's true. But the, the X-Pro1 Mint, I reckon, in a few years' time, X-Pro1 Mint in the original box mm. uh, will be worth quite a bit. Uh, so. The original X100, however, yeah. will be worth more because that original box is the lovely red velvety type slow release box. Oh. That was... <laughs> steady. <laughs> Steady on. <laughs> that was uh, that was lovely. Rubbing my legs. 
<laughs> that was lovely. And I kept the X one, uh, the Jeff X one hundred box yeah. because, uh, well, the box itself is probably worth two grand. So. Yeah, <laughs> the box is worth more <laughs> yeah. than the camera. <laughs> Ah, oh, well, there we go. There, there's some suggestions for you, Elias, and and, and enjoy. Right, your um, your question. Okay, so I have a question here from Binny B. Binny B. Binny B. And she is from. Uh, she says, "Best wishes." Well, do we know she Binny? No, could that's be he. very true. Actually, very true. It's, it could be a he. Right, Binny B. Binny B. Instagram dot com. Binny B. B i n n i b. Let me go look it up. Check it out. Best wishes from Iceland, the Niceland. <laughs> And oh. it is. Iceland and Iceland. I've only ever been once. I flew in. I stayed in Reykjavik um, Airport and flew out again. Binny B. So in Instagram. Binny B. Insta- B-I-N-N-I-B. I'll go on with a question. Hi, Kevin and Neil. I have been listening to your fantastic show from episode one and really love your show and your work. Monday. So B-I-N-N-I-B. I-B. There we go. Binny B. Binny B. Well, we still don't know. No, we still don't know because there's a mysterious picture of who it could be. Man of mystery. Woman, woman of mystery. Yeah, I do like yeah. to look at that picture of the beer with the Icelandic background. Oh, there. look at that. Yeah. See, now that's a bit like when I flew in, that was me and Reykjavik, beer, looking out onto that sort of scene. Yeah. I could have stayed there just, just drinking beer. Mondays are my holy day. Listen and relax. Mm. Yada, 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 yada. I've been dabbling in the hobby of taking photos for some time using Fujifilm, Fujifilm cameras and lenses. Well, You're I, very good I, at I, it. I was going to say, I'd hardly call it dabbling. No. Looking at your, your Instagram. He's he's somebody who observes. You find things. That, this is somebody who observes and finds things. That's what the Instagram suggests to me. That mm-hmm. you have this sort of fascination in objects. Mm. Go back to the top. Mm-hmm. Things I like. Love, like, share. Love, like, share. Yeah. Beautiful. We still don't know whether it's a bloke or a woman, though. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> Binny uh, B. Binny B. Will forever be. Yeah. Uh, right, where was I? Um, I've been dabbling in the hobby of taking photos for some time, using feature film cameras and lenses, and as we said, you're very good. Yeah. That has given me great satisfaction. I have a question for you guys, which is about taking photos in general. I hope that you understand the question. Okay. Right. Question about quality of images. Mm-hmm. Right. You ready for this? Mm-hmm. Strap yourself in, Neil. When taking a picture, mm. and we can take landscape, for example, in both cases, correct exposure. One handheld, f8, one five hundredth of a second, 200 ISO. Second, tripod with an ND filter, f8, 160, 200 ISO. Will the images be different, and why? <laughs> These are the questions I always used to dread at school. <laughs> <laughs> Discuss. Uh, excellent. And I'd go, excellent. Oh, no, just write it down, any old uh, stuff. <laughs> and then at the end, I'd, I'd think, oh, I didn't read the question properly. If George had four apples mm. and Fred had two oranges, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. How many bananas did I never liked George or the other one. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so let's work this out. We need Carl. This is a Carl question, isn't it? Is it is a Carl question. Handheld, F8, yeah. one five hundredth of a second. If you ask me the way I pre- so. prefer to, to shoot, it would be the handheld way. <laughs> that's not the question. But that's this not the question. The, yeah. See, I told you I don't read the questions properly. So the, let's look at the – let's disseminate this, right? So mm. the difference in aperture mm. is none. No. They're both F8. Yes. The difference in ISO is none. They're both 200. Yes. Shutter speed is substantially different. Yeah. However, one on a tripod has an ND filter at 1 60th of a second, okay? So as we know, an ND filter will block light yes. coming in. Yeah. The one sixtieth of a of a second will allow more light to come in because it's open for longer than mm. one five hundredth of a second. Mm. So the difference, essentially, what we need to know to to identify if there will be difference in light, because and nothing else will change. It's only going to be the light, is how strong that ND filter is. We don't know. That is the unknown. That's the X in your yeah. algebra. It's if down. X if X is equal to Y and Y is equal to Z, I'd what's have, Y plus X? Out of P. Yeah. So we we, please, Bob. we don't know the ND filter the strength of it, but oh, on the, on the, on the, on the, everything else, you know, it, it all depends on how much. It, so that and the difference between one five hundredth of a second and one sixtieth of a second is, um, I don't know what would that be in terms of stops, light. I don't know. I, I can't get my head around that much. But if it's the if it's the exact same as the amount of the ND filter is stopping in, in let stopping from coming in as in maybe it's two stops or two and a half stops or three yeah. stops, then the picture should be identical. Um, although, if you're shooting at handheld at f8, 1500th of a second, 200 ISO, it's probably going to be blurry <laughs> because your body will move. Well, not at 500th. It's not going to be that blurry, is it? F8. Oh, F8. 
Yeah, well, maybe. Well, no, no, because it's still well, one, he, one five hundredth. Yeah. So anyway, well, we never really answered the question, but it was a good mental workout, and we enjoyed looking at your work, Benny. Yeah. Well the, uh, and in his Instagram feed, by the way, or there's her. one. Of, there's uh, or her. There's um, there's uh, a picture of Matt Hart. Who obviously went to Iceland. Oh, look, it's Matt Hart with a cat. During the war? <laughs> what was he doing there? Uh, Blimey. Yeah, these are great. They are great. Yeah. Oh, look, he's got now, now, he's got a picture of, uh, of urinals. <laughs> the urinals. That's like my bathroom project. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, laundrette. <laughs> oh, oh, hard back to last week's show. Look at that, laundrette, yeah. Ah, now there's, the, there's two people here. Now, one of those is Binny B. How do you know? I think that's Binny B. Self portrait. There we go. Ah, look, he doesn't. He, he looks like a proper Icelandic. Yeah, he does. Looks like a warrior, weathered warrior. Yeah, he does. Binny B is the coolest looking listener we have. Look at that. That's self-por- official. Self portrait from inside his fridge. Yeah, that's inside very his fridge. Very clever. Yeah, of course it is. How do they get inside his fridge? Well, that's a fridge door. Oh, isn't no, it's in, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, well, that, there we go. Check out Binny B's Instagram. We, did, we, we shall put it on the show notes. We did at least work that out. Yeah, yeah, sorry. We, we did find out your gender, but uh, we couldn't <laughs> answer your question. Use this on the mathematics <laughs> question. Uh, uh, I, uh, my brain is so frazzled, I can't even remember whose go it is. <laughs> it's yours. Is it my go? Oh, no, no, it's not my go, is it? We've, uh, we've been saved by the bell. It's time to swing by a different dimension. Send you, Kev, back to Malmesbury for 10 minutes so that you can go into the Facebook, the Fujicast Facebook group and dig around of the questions left for product specialist Carl Hare. We're kneeling in your presence, Carl. Hail to the chief engineer. Go on then, Kev. Kick off with the questions. All right. On to our very own um, moderator, Steve Vaughan. And he says, why do my X-T3s and every other X-Series camera I have owned, and I think he's owned a lot, mm-hmm. when using flash, whilst the camera is on auto ISO, always set an ISO that seems far too high with TTL flash? Uh, so again, this could be a dynamic range setting. Uh, it mm. could be that you're on auto dynamic range and it will always try and push um, for the optimal dynamic range, which is normally 200 that I found over the, the couple of cameras that I've had. Um, which will then push the ISO up and the shutter speed goes with it. Or I think you replied very well to this, Kev. Just stop using flash. Yeah, yeah, that was my (laughs) answer. Stop using flash. What's the point? Stupid thing. Anyway, um, Stuart Ashley says... uh, I'm kidding, by the way, everybody. Stuart Ashley says, can I use my X-T2 as a webcam? And if possible, how? Yeah, so uh, I think Steve actually put an answer to this in the group. Um, There's a little piece of kit called the Elgato Cam Link. um, Other... HDMI USB converters are available, um, but that's the one that I use. Uh, I've used it for all of the Fujifilm one to ones using the X series cameras. Mm. Uh, about 120 quid for the the little HDMI USB converter, or you can use the Fujifilm webcam mm-hmm. support, which was version 2.0 came out a couple of days ago. And that works with the XT2. Yes, yeah, basically any cameras that can tether, uh, right. and then you've got the XT200 and the XA7 uh, as well built into that. Miles Gohm says uh, it's not specifically Fujifilm related, but in a room with different types of lamps in electronic shutter, what is the minimum maximum shutter speed I should use? One uh, sixtieth of a second, does that equal 60 hertz? Yeah, so you always want to try and match up the frequency of the light to your shutter speed or a variant of, so 30, 60, 120. Um, over here it's 50. So, yeah, 50, 100, 150, 25. Uh, it's the same in video. We get that a lot with shutter speed and frame rates and stuff. You want to try and match those up. But it, electronic shutter is can be a challenge with um, sodium lamps, fluorescent lamps, um, and some really cheap LEDs because they use a really cheap driver and they flicker and mm. stuff like that. So I would try and avoid it if possible. Um, but if you absolutely have to use electronic shutter, then, yeah, try and match it up to a uh, variable of your uh, frequency of the light. And what, what I typically do if I'm shooting at a wedding, for example, and uh, and it's in a church and it's got those kind of sodium heaters and all that kind of stuff, I will I will do a very fast burst on the electronic shutter and uh, and then scroll through the images and you can see if there's a flicker because yeah. if you just take one picture you might not see it and then you'll be surprised when you're doing your editing. Um, yeah. So if you just do a burst. Some of the cameras now have the flicker reduction built in, which is good, mm-hmm. um, but it's not foolproof. So, no. yeah, I, I would test it, like you say. Uh, and then if you get banding and stuff like that, switch over to the mechanical shutter. We are on to Aaron Cousins, and he says, it is often mentioned that Fujifilm cameras use ISO-less sensors, which I understand always record at the base setting. 
any brightening is then applied in camera by the software. Does that mean that you could run around photographing everything at the base ISO and then apply brightening afterwards, maybe even selectively? Now, this is the ISO invariant stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, technically, you could go around shooting everything at ISO 160. That would present its own challenges if your shutter speed was too high and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, ISO invariants um, is a product of um, the sensor manufacturing process. Um, it helps us out in photography a lot. I do a lot of astrophotography and it helps us out for that. Um, but yes, you could effectively shoot everything at ISO 160 and bring back um, using the dynamic range and stuff like that in post-processing. But obviously, if you get to the limit of the dynamic range and the shadows and things like that, then the image is actually going to look worse uh, because you're trying to do too much to the image, which yeah. is then it's all about signal to noise ratio. Uh, and there's loads of technical stuff behind that. There's loads of videos on uh, YouTube and stuff about it as well. But um, yeah. Aaron, yes, effectively you could, but that brings its own set of challenges as well now joe hart bowden he says a basic question <laughs> there's never a basic question joe <laughs> i'm about to jump in the car and buy the xt4 and 50 to 140 to replace my xt3 and 55 to 200 am i doing the right thing or do i have gas <laughs> well i <laughs> notice a marked difference in camera and lens performance that's his question um xt4 50 140 or xt3 55 200 <laughs> um it depends what you need in your camera and your lens um, if you need 200 mil in your lens, you're not going to get that with a 50 to 140. Um, if you need image stabilization, the new battery, the new flippy screen, etc., etc., then you need an XT4 over an XT3. Um, mm. You know, firmware updates and all that kind of stuff can potentially bring stuff over to different cameras. We've seen it in the past, but um, it's about what you need rather than what could or and things yeah. like that, you know. Anna McCarthy says, um, a very boring one, for about how long does a fully charged battery last in the X100V, would you say, with the camera on? And a fair bit of reviewing in between, a rough idea, would be useful. Um, yeah, it depends on how much you're uh, reviewing or not. I mean, Fujifilm say battery life on the X100V is approximately 350 shots, um, or 420 if you use the optical viewfinder rather than the EVF. Mm. Um, however, in practice, a lot of people get a lot more than that out of their batteries yeah um you know the last wedding i shot i shot one and a half batteries in a camera and got something like three thousand images yeah yeah um, that's kind of my hit ratio as well i always get surprised when people people say oh i'm not getting enough battery yeah it's probably one of the biggest questions i've been asked over the last three years of working with fujifilm mm. uh, is battery life because other brands and everything it seems to you know they seem to go from 300 to 700 and things like that but mm. um you've then got to look at the internals and all that kind of stuff in the camera but now i think and correct me if i'm wrong when they do the uh, is it called sepa testing for the yeah. battery life yes yeah. i think that they have to test it in uh, with the camera on basically with every setting on and the flash firing and all that kind of stuff um so they have to give essentially the you know worst case scenario rather than the best case scenario on the box yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, you will all, all, I mean, I really get a lot more, but, uh, you know, I don't use flash and I rarely kind of review on the LCD and stuff like that. And one of the other things that I've always done, which I think kind of helps is I typically switch off as much of the information on the LCD that I don't need. Mm -hmm. So things like histogram and I pretty much have my exposure and my battery indicator and, and that's about it um and exposure values so yeah. that i think kind of helps with battery life because it's it's displaying less stuff you know on the lcd so it's less diodes doing its dioding <laughs> yeah and the other thing i tell people is just turn the camera off in between shooting yeah that, that's yeah. The, the biggest one that's got me the most um out of my batteries the cameras mm. are really quick to turn on now um you know it's better than letting it go to sleep and then trying to let it wake up well, this is the last question for this um, session, and uh, hopefully we'll have Carl on again. This is, this is a really interesting question from Ed Hubbard, and he says, face detection disables spot metering, but set focus and exposure for human faces. 
except, and then in, in uh, inverted comments or air quotes, he says, in some modes, the camera may set exposure for the frame as a whole. Does this translate as it does spot meter the selected face unless it decides to center multi or maybe average? Do we know which modes trigger the wider metering? <laughs> there you go. I'll leave that to you, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, so the camera will use uh, spot metering for a face and an eye if it can. If it can't, then it will use a wider metering now. Um, for things like uh, Facebook Live, YouTube, blogging, blogging, things like that, where the camera can see a face, it will meter off the face. Right. If you then put something in front of the camera, so let's say you wanted to show a product or something, and it goes, oh, I can't see a face, then it will use the wider meter, and then you'll find the background will get brighter or darker depending on your subject at the front. Okay, so regardless of what spot metering is set to, uh, it's effectively going to do what it can to get the best exposure for the face yeah, essentially. Yeah. Well, that that's how I found it using yeah. uh, the XT3 and the XT4 for Facebook and YouTube yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. I didn't know the answer to that, but that yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, that was good. I enjoyed that, Carl. And um, thank you very much for uh, you know stopping by and, and helping us out. We will hopefully do this again if people find it useful. Um, now, although Carl is a Fujifilm. Uh, technical guru and brainy person, general brainy person. He's also a very, very good photographer. Stop and it. he mentioned his, um, uh, what do you call it when you photograph the space? What's that called? Space photography. No, what do you call Astro. it? Astro. Astro photography. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Astro photography. I used to have a game called Astro Wars when I was a kid. I used to love that. Um, anyway, so uh, where can they uh, where can they see some of that stuff if it is publicly available, Carl? Yeah, so I've got a, a personal um instagram and facebook so i'm carl hair on facebook and carl underscore hair underscore photography on instagram uh, and then i've got the work one so carl hair fujifilm uk uh, and on instagram and i think it's carl fujifilm uk on facebook uh, any other hints and tips you want to just quickly throw at everybody sports photography or anything that moves wedding brides down the aisle whatever look at your afc custom modes go through them try them out so one of the first questions people ask about autofocus mm sit there for 20 minutes and have a play see what you think so yeah that's my number one top tip have a play with the afc custom settings and see what they do huge amount of thanks to carl hare our chief engineer on the show the man who knows all there is to know and of course he's a regular contributor to the fujicast facebook group he'll still be there of course and we hope to have carl back on the show soon with with kev sitting in the uh, the chief engineer's seat right this week before we get back to the questions, um, interview-wise, a slight departure from the norm and something that caught our eye here at Fujicast HQ. Uh, Ryan Katsanis is a listener and contributor to the, the Fujicast in the Facebook group too, but he'd popped up a note there about a certain project he'd been piecing together that we thought you may be interested to hear about too. So for the kids in cars listening who really want to be listening to Radio 1 or Kiss LA, a, a little history lesson. Bef before the movie and Insta sensation you now know as The Rock, before he was famous, and actually ni nine years before he was even born, one of the most infamous prisons in the world closed. That was the original The Rock. And if you think the modern day rock is badass with attitude, you should have spent some time getting to know this one. And we're just about to because Ryan Katsanis has had some pretty special access to parts of it. Day release gel tourists don't usually get to see some of the bits that Ryan's been around. Um, so, Ryan, it's, it's, it's 10 years back. Well, just over, actually, this, this project, give or take. But you've only, only just released it as a, as a film that I, I saw. Why, why the wait? I mean, that's, that's half a life sentence to bring it into some sort of prison context. That's right. Yeah. So I wanted to get those shots in while I could, uh, while I still live down in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but when I made those shots, my original intent was to put some kind of a book together with it, whether it was uh, self-published or what have you, uh, and working with my uncle who worked on The Rock to kind of put explanations to what people are looking at. Mm. Uh, and so my son was six months old when that went down, and uh, life kind of got in the way, so it just kind of sat on my uh, hard drives gathering virtual dust. Um, and honestly, I didn't realize that that much time had passed. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, my photographic uh, skills had grown. And mm -hmm. so the more I looked at back at those pictures, the more I kind of cringed. And I thought, oh, I was such a beginner back then. And, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I was just kind of reluctant to really do much with them. Um, 
But the uh, a few weeks ago, I started watching on YouTube some urban exploration videos, and I, you know, between you and me, I was kind of thinking, gosh, some of these pictures are just awful. My my Alcatraz <laughs> stuff is actually way better than this, uh, you know, and I still don't think it's very good, but I I think it was better than that. So I was like. That's what it could be. It could be a YouTube video. Yeah. And, I, and I've been doing that. Ironically, I've been doing that uh, in other areas of my life, making YouTube videos. And so uh, it's just kind of a light bulb went off. So at 11 o'clock at night, I started putting together a video <laughs> and spent the next three hours laser focused on that. A spooky way to spend uh, the dark hours looking back <laughs> at Alcatraz pictures. Yeah. I, I, the, obviously, Alcatraz is one of the... Um, because they still have visitors, don't they, now? They do, yeah. yeah. Apparently, literally right now, you can only go on the outside of it. Right, um, okay. Which is not nearly as fun as going no, inside. No, but, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's the inside that make, makes the place, isn't yeah. it? But but what, what did uh, you think that you could perhaps... Um, get out of Alcatraz because it's been photographed a good few times I, I guess it's this access thing that you had that other people don't have exactly yeah so uh, my uncle was the uh, head of maintenance on the island um, for about 25 years and he you know said hey I can let you go pretty much anywhere and there are some pretty decrepit parts of the island yeah. um, and so my attraction was primarily that I got to see stuff that most people couldn't yeah. and I could bring a camera did did he did he insist that he would go with you, or were you allowed just to wander and and you know, frankly get lost in in the place? Yeah, it was kind of a mix of both. He he let me go wherever. He stayed wow. with me the whole time. Wow. Uh, but yeah, he was letting me go pretty much wherever I wanted. So um, the laundry, which is where you see all those really decrepit yeah. pipes and machines and stuff yeah. like that, that whole area is is completely. Uh, dangerous and falling apart um which i thought was some of the coolest stuff to see but yeah he he just said let's let's go around and he showed mm. me everything i could possibly want to get into did your uncle ever say why the place wasn't torn down because a, a lot of people have, have um suggested that they wanted to take the rock apart because of the, the terrible history that it had yeah i do know that it is a huge money maker <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> that'll be you know, the tourist is strong on there and they yeah. ha they held um private parties and events there too and uh yeah I would assume that it's primarily driven by money as everything is. Yeah. Tell, tell me that they haven't uh, when you say events they've not held weddings there have they or have they they they've had wow. so like some of the dot com <laughs> parties and things like wow. that I, I know for sure they've had that i'm not i'm not totally sure about weddings Imagine but I, I would not be surprised alcatraz wedding amazing yeah so this is such a well-known place because of the movies which are usually about escaping from the island which because of the current you know the freezing water and the, and the apparent sharks although i understand that was a that wasn't wasn't exactly true that, that there were man-eating sharks around the island. I think I think it used to be fed, to use a um, a pun, to the the prisoners just to make sure they didn't think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly not far west of the Golden Gate Bridge, mm. uh, out in the actual ocean proper there mm. there are sharks but yeah. not so much in the bay yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but um, i mean it looks really calm i wonder when you were stood there taking uh, and making your pictures whether you looked out and thought do you know what it's only a mile i, I reckon you know i could swim this yeah it does it 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 does feel much closer than you know they want you to think that it's impossible to escape you know and yeah. um they do have like races and things i guess with proper gear and training people swim from there and back right. nowadays so people have swum to it and back yeah absolutely wow yeah okay. well, although with less guns trained trained on them when then exactly yeah that's the hard <laughs> part <laughs> used to be the case so uh, did you get a sense of what it would have been like for this to be home i mean one of, one of the things i heard was that nobody was actually sentenced on alcatraz that you went to Alcatraz without a sentence. It was a, a kind of like a... One website described it as kind of like a holiday from the jail you were in until you behaved them yourself, and then you, you got to go back to the jail to s serve out the rest of your sentence. So this was a literal home, obviously, where people didn't know when they were going to be moving out, if at all. Yeah, that's similar to my understanding. So essentially what my uncle has told me was that a lot of the prisoners were transferred there because they were behaving poorly in the other prisons they were in. And so this was sort of a form of punishment was yeah. to send them to this super secure hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of them were coming from other prisons and, and they were just some of the worst of the worst that society had. What, were, what, what were the parts that sort of um, I, I've, I've photographed a, a debtor's jail, which is in a place called Bobmin, which is close to or on the moor. I can't quite remember. It was a 
a few years ago, actually. And I always remember there being this, this, it was, I can't really describe it, horrible feeling of, and maybe it was my imagination as creative playing into force there, but what was it like being inside? How, what kind of feeling did you get? Because you spent more time alone than most tourists would there. Yeah, um, it's definitely um, smaller than you might think. It's, it's, I don't know how many cells they actually had, but it's, it's a pretty small prison. Right. Um, that was one of the things that I kind of, uh, in my mind, it was much bigger until I was actually standing there. The cells themselves are, are actually pretty good size. I would say, I also mm -hmm. thought that some of those were pretty decrepit looking at this point, you know, very small little sink and a little steel, uh, bed and mattress. But, um, then there's the, 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 the whole, you know, basically solitary confinement, uh, that to me is is terrifying. Uh, just mentally imagining being in a dark hole. <laughs> what what was the hole? How did you get into? The, was that the the long corridor with the with that they used to call the dungeon, or was that a? Because I saw your photograph of of yeah. what I think was yeah. Called so the that area is directly below the solitary. That is the right. oldest part of the prison. Right. Um, but I just meant literally up in, up above in solitary, where you have almost no light for 24 hours a day and you're just stuck in a, in a dark room. I kind of felt a sense of panic when the door was closed just to kind of get an experience of it. And it, it goes pitch black. Now you were fairly fresh to photography when you made this story. Um, first up, why black and white? I just thought it had to be in black and white. I look at them in color and it doesn't even feel right to me. I mean, so much of it is gray anyway, yeah. you know, so that's part of it. But um, when I look at it in color, and it was a it was a gloomy weather day, as you saw from the the shot from the boat. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't give it that mood and that sense that you feel when you're actually there. And it just to me, it screams it has to be in black and white. Mm. And and you said you'd have done it differently these days. What what would you have done differently then, Ryan? Yeah, uh, just taking my time a little bit more. Um, you know, there, there's kind of a, a catch twenty two. So on the on the one hand, I was I was in that phase of being a beginner photographer where everything looks like a photo, mm. and you're you know a little more childlike, and you could just snap away and happily get whatever you get. Um, but now I know that if I had gone back, or if I could go back, I would do it with much more purpose. Um, and so that's my biggest fear about sharing these pictures is I feel like a lot of them are technically not very strong. Yeah. I think they're being carried by the fact that you're looking at stuff that most people don't get to see. So there's there's a lot of value in that. Uh, any chance of going back? I mean, Uncle Ray is still with us, fortunately. Maybe he could get he you back is, on again. Yeah, he doesn't work there anymore. He's since retired. Mm. But, um, but yeah, I think if I were able to show up with him, uh, coincidentally, I had talked to him recently, and he was telling me that he thinks he's the only guy in the country that knows how to repair the jail's doors and stuff like that. Wow. So they've consulted with <laughs> him and brought him back to the island because apparently uh, since he's retired, uh, they've had quite a bit of turnover. Mm. And so he has to keep going back to show the people how to repair things. Tell, tell me about some of the, the detail in, in the pictures, Ryan, some of the stuff that – because um, I know you feel you might like to come back and annotate some of this and, and tell people, may, maybe even narrate it, and tell people what, what some of the, the parts were. I think there's a cross or something. Absolutely, yeah. There's a, there's a couple of gems in there that um, I'd like to get back with my uncle and have him explain exactly what he knows about what we're looking at. Um, but one example is there's a picture of a, a cross on a square yeah. um, that is a pretty boring picture if you don't know what you're looking at. But that is the spot where the escape from Alcatraz folks popped up um, and escaped, you know, and never to be seen again. Um, so that's a really cool one. Um, another example of that is there's a picture of cell 181, right. um, which is actually on the second floor. Um, and that was Al Capone's last cell that he was in before he was released. Yeah. However, they don't tell the tourists that anymore. <laughs> the uh, reason for that is because people had been putting graffiti in there. They've been leaving uh, flowers in there right. um, and then blocking the way so that you can't get by to go on your tour. So we probably so shouldn't, now, share, we shouldn't share that number then, should we? <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. My <laughs> uncle's like, no, it's fine. They're not going to tell the people while they're there anyway. But yeah. Uh, and actually some people, uh, it sounds like plenty of people do know that fact because they'll sneak up there anyway. Um, ah. But by and large, they no longer tell the tourists that anymore because they've been, it's been causing more work than it's worth. There's a lot, there's a few haunted stories as well, aren't there, from, from the place? Because although the, the death penalty, the execution was never carried out on, on the rock, 
Yeah. Um, there were quite a few deaths amongst inmates due to suicide and and murders on the island. So there's you know there, there, there's there's quite a few haunting stories, aren't there? Yeah, there are. To be honest, I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but they do they do talk about that and they do haunted tours apparently every now and again at night time. But yeah, it was it's a violent and dangerous crew that was yeah, there yeah. for for sure. Well, that's a that's a go back with the camera and do the night stuff then, Ryan. When you do go back, yeah. go back and do the, the the haunted tour. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. <laughs> I, uh, in fact, I need to get more shots of just the stuff that everybody gets to see. Th- that video is almost exclusively stuff that is not on the tour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there a part you you desperately didn't like? Down in the oldest part of the prison, under the solitary confinement, there's like a roundish cave. <laughs> yeah. And when you go down there, apparently that was from the late 1850s. Um, and it was, I think, a military establishment at the time. Mm. Um, but whatever it was, down there gives me the creeps. And, and mm. I'm not somebody who's into supernatural and, and all those things, but just you get this heavy feeling down there. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I did not enjoy being underground. I, I, would, imagine, I would imagine it was quite cold and, and quite, you know, that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's just so decrepit. And there's like those pictures where there's a solitary light bulb in the ceiling. Right that sort of thing it just it lends itself to a horror film and there'll be a link to ryan's project where you too can experience the sights of alcatraz incidentally and not that he needs support in this one it's clear that it wasn't a happy place but alcatraz is known to be one of the united states most haunted prisons the island was recognized actually also by by local native american tribes to have been haunted by evil spirits such a a cruel soulless place easy as one commentator said to understand how the spirits of many inmates could still be stuck there and uh, i read this actually at cell 14d a cold feeling remains today almost 100 years after a man mysteriously died there yelling of a spirit with yellow eyes attempting to kill him later guards actually reported seeing him at roll call visitors to the prison report strange feelings and uh, things that go on Uh, including a psychic who reported speaking to a man who was murdered at Alcatraz called Butcher, and a park ranger reported hearing a banjo playing in the shower room. Now, the most infamous prisoner to have played that instrument there, I found out, was none other than Al Capone, who didn't die there, but uh, he himself went on to pass years later having delusional chats with long-dead friends. Shiver and spines comes to mind. And on that note, let's get back to your questions. Um, Andrew Higgins. Now, it's, a lo- it's not so much a question, but really an observation. Mm-hmm. And I just there's a few points he might want to comment about, Kev. A new normal discussion point over the, the few shows recently has been working on distancing, numbers of people, and, of course, face masks. And, of course, the rules are changing all the time. Um, you know, last week's 15 could be next week's 7. Uh, <laughs> an event. Who knows? I'm a jobbing photographer with a small agency shooting almost anything from football to corporate and commercial work to editorial. Whilst almost all work was cancelled at the start of lockdown, as a staff photographer I was furloughed. Some work has still been trickling in, mostly from a magazine we work for. Um, During lockdown, he legally took a break from furlough to briefly return to work and is uh, now back under the the part-time, well, furloughs becoming something else isn't it anyway here's a car boot full of face masks gloves and numerous small bottles of hand sanitizer the camera bag has one or two of each i was out and about while the country was locked away i photographed people who themselves had to carry on working through lockdown and what a joy it was to meet people after weeks of isolation anyway um it's a long thing here about being pandemic aware not pandemic terrified which he thinks it's the attitude that perhaps we should now um be be um be thinking or you know because we are pandemic terrified, uh, and, and that's affecting our industry. More relevant to wedding photography are the social jobs I've covered recently as public events have been allowed to happen. Attendees are required to wear face masks, but uh, as I'm only shooting a small number of guests, I simply leave them a short distance away from the main function, ask if they're in a bubble together, take off the masks, shoot a few frames, masks back on, job done. Mm. Are we overcomplicating it? Well, I don't know. It's a really interesting point. I... I... <sighs> I mean, I. It's from Andrew Higgins. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm not terrified of the pandemic. Mm. I'm not terrified of the virus. No, um, no, I'm not personally. Um, so every time I, know, I work in a big town, I come back. I wait ten days to fourteen days, yeah, and I think, oh, got away with that. Yeah, maybe. I, I, you know, I'm not saying that it's 
you know, I mean, if you'd read all the stuff, we may both have had it and never knew about it. Well, you think you did? Well, I definitely you had, had a few to... days where you really laid low during the the actual lockdown. I didn't did you? have. Um, I was very lethargic. I mm. could hardly get up the stairs without losing, you know, breath. Mm. Um, but with, I never with, lost with, yeah. taste or smell, and I did have a, a cough for a few days. But you know, if if that was it, then I was very lucky. Mm. Um, but but anyway, uh, so it's not actually the virus that that, that you know that worries me and. and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to be aware of it. I, I definitely don't agree with people who are doing jobs and or where the clients specifically are yeah. flouting the rules. Yes. Well, I, I had that, didn't I? I would, remember yeah. I went into the church and you I was asked that. to remove my mask. Yeah, <laughs> I know people, I know I lots of people who have, who have ended up doing, uh, you know, shoots and stuff that that basically are illegal. And you know it's they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because obviously we need the money, want the money, but but where do you draw the line? And and for me, I feel like the well, the rights and the wrongs of of the politics of it all are ir- irrelevant. This is the law. This is what you have to do. So do it. And you know, yeah, you're right. Make sure you've got all of the stuff in the car you need to to get on with it. But I can tell you something now. If this is the norm, if this is going to be the norm forever, mm-hmm. then I'm. And now I'm just going to go and buy a rock in the middle of the sea and sit on that. <laughs> I, I don't know where I want to be involved in that. No. Photographically you had wise. A f- there was a Facebook question that came in about this. So Scott, Scott, it's Scott, isn't it? Scott Johnson posted yeah. the question. Uh, essentially, we, we we're not going to read it all out because it's 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 for another time. But essentially, saying it's tough. You know, it's tough for everybody. Mm. Uh, you know what what's going to happen. And then Morton Jensen uh, says uh, it commented along the lines saying, "Is it possible? And in case uh, and in this case, how difficult is it to shift from wedding photography to other genres?" So he was just po- should, posing the question, wasn't he? Should wedding photography? Yeah. No yeah. longer be a thing. Well, I'm I'm I'll be laying ha- cards on the table. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 going to embrace co- more commercial work uh-huh. from now on. Uh-huh. But I think I've said that before anyway. But but um, the question came because I'm still m- mid flow doing the website at the moment, and uh, I've started working on the the homepage. And the question was, should it have uh, the question? That was just myself and my wife were talking about this. Should, should it now promote weddings or should it be more general photography? And I thought, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I, actually for the next six months, um, you know, as, 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 why don't I just embrace having more generalised approach to the website? Yeah, I mean, you can do that, of course. And I think a lot of people probably will. Is it a good or bad thing when you become the jack of all trades? Oh, I think I don't think, think we mull over so much. I this don't question. think beggars can be choosers at the moment, can mm. they? If somebody comes along, I'm doing a commercial shoot in uh, next week up mm. in Scotland somewhere. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'm going to do that. Could be very, I'm very happy to do that, mm. but yeah, whatever. I mean, whatever works. It's it's you've got to fight through this, and and of course, wedding photography will come back. But it, I honestly don't believe that we are, you know, going to be back to normal in terms of regular weddings, biggish weddings, smallish weddings, or For you know, while. just like as we were before the pandemic. Mm. It's going to be a couple of years. People, you think it's a couple of years? Yeah, I don't think. Really? I don't think people generally, no, generally, are going to start investing and spending 25, 30 grand on a wedding when it could be called, pulled off by the government. You could get the COVID itself. Your photographer could, the registrar could on the morning. There's so many, until basically it's no longer a thing. Um, you know, in in any major way, mm. I think it's always going to be here. Mm. But in any major way, I don't think we'll see weddings as they were. Mm. That doesn't mean that they we can't we won't still have some form of it. But I just don't think people will. Would you? It would be a very difficult discussion to have at the moment. I think, wouldn't it? I, I really hope that by by autumn next uh, spring next year that you know we're back at level one and pretty much it's it's just a well. I mean, treatments and vaccines will obviously assist that, won't they? Because the one thing could happen and this thing would just totally flip tomorrow. It would change. Yes, but even with... It's tre- one thing, one y- thing. Yes, you're right, absolutely. But even with treatments and vaccines, it's not going to just disappear. As soon as they invent a vaccine, it's not just going to... Even if they vaccinate everybody in the world, that would take decades. It's, well, no, it's, well, no, no, I don't... It's not going to no. go away, is it? I don't think overnight. it's going to take decades. I mean, I, th- I think the vaccination programme and, and the plans I heard for it... Uh, are actually quite progressive and and made me feel a lot lot better. Um, but, they, but but 
because you don't need to vaccinate everybody. No, of course not. No. Yeah. But yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. If I was a couple, if I if I were one part of a couple now talking to my partner, I'd be saying, "Hmm, let's hold back a little bit longer." Yeah. Definitely. But I, I'm careful how I say that because I've got clients that have booked me into April, May, June, July next year. No, no, no. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, the ones that have booked yeah. and the ones who are already in See the in, through, please. Uh, the ones that are already in, in the mix. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And their weddings, uh, you know, come come March next year. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I I hope and and you know confident that those weddings will go ahead mm. as 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 normal. I can't um, see how they couldn't. I, I just, I mean. But my point is, who is going to be planning? If you're not already in yeah. the in the mix, who's going to be planning now? And mm, there's all of the dates next year have gone with the postponements from this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people made unemployed as well. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things in the mix. This is why I say I don't think it, I think it's going to be a couple of years mm. before we're back in in the in the real world, so to speak. Rishi, lend us a fiver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oi, Rishi, <laughs> give us a fiver. Yeah, right. Okay. And on that positive note, let's yes. look. Let's look at the books. Yeah. Back to <laughs> let's, my. Let's cook the books. Back to black and white. <laughs> yes. Um, oh. And another one. Another one of our favourite type of photography, which is a nostalgic look at London. This is London street photography by Johnny Stiletto. Oh, Johnny Stiletto. Vintage eighties. Yeah. Uh, I love that picture on the front cover. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah. You see, there's something about the underground. Yeah. There was a particular look of. In, you know, so what? What do you what? What read that picture what makes, out to people? What makes so that describe, an 80s picture? Describe it. Well, I suppose the clothing makes that. So it's a guy on uh, the uh, on, on a London Underground train. They've slightly changed now the design of the London Underground. So if you if you travel it regularly, you'll know that um, just there's the very small things like the handles and, that you used to hold on that used to mm-hmm. wiggle it. That they've changed a bit. Mm. Do you know what else has changed about it that that couldn't be taken in 2020? Not a lot, is there? Really, no. the signs are similar. You do still have some on the district line. You do still have some trains with those little uh, knobbly, bulbous, the wiggly, hanging downy things. Holy downy thing. <laughs> um, I love the way the guy on the front cover. So on the back cover, though, we're only talking about the front cover. Yeah, on the yeah. back cover. No, now I can see the cars. Things have changed. Fashion has changed. Yeah, but what? what People, men are wearing more hats. What I was interested in is on the there is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people crammed mm. onto that seat. Uh, none of them, of course, using phones. None of them looking at a newspaper, apart from one man who's reading Hi Fi magazine. Let's have a look again. Big now old, you've mentioned the phones. That's big old Hi Fi magazine. Yeah. And the other ones are just looking bored. Yeah. Yeah. But with, uh, at which point, usually, they would whip out the phone and start playing Candy Crush. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes I get a little bit annoyed when people, you know, bash people for, you know, oh, everybody's on their phones, everybody's yeah. everybody's doing stuff. And it's like, yeah, well, okay, but that's because they don't want to look like those people <laughs> on the front of this magazine. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> on the front of this book. What's your resting face like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you look miserable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so vintage 80s, uh, we should get over this. One book. of your clients used to say something like that when you were at a wedding. Uh, Cheer uh, up, Kev, might not. Never yeah, happen. yeah. That's my resting face. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Like, that's my resting face. <laughs> um, okay, so the uh, this is a Frank, uh, published by Francis Lincoln Limited. Now, the right. price on the back of this uh, was £14.99. Uh, and I bought this on the 15th of the 2nd, 2013, in foils in London. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's an. Is it foil still around? It says that on the back. No, foils went, I think. Oh, and, uh, no. I think it got taken over. Oh. Anyway, it's another one of those books where a uh, photographer f- has uh, wandered around in the 80s, of course, and picked up just general nostalgia. So I'm just flipping to page. Uh, it doesn't have any page numbers, but I flipped to a page with a lady, yeah. and she looks. She couldn't look more what? typical late middle aged lady, early 70s, perhaps. She's got a massive handbag. Uh, the that per- looked like my auntie, uh, uh, auntie well, who wasn't an auntie Phyllis, but that looks like auntie Phyllis that used to work in Granddad's sweet shop. All seventies, auntie Phyllis. Says. All people, all women in their seventies in the nineteen eighties look like that. Yep, that's right. Um, Go on then, find me another uh, picture, not not with uh, not with auntie Phyllis. Okay, so this is one called Messengers of Doom. This right. page, um, and uh, he's he's taken this picture of the uh, the evening news when it was still called the evening news. Although he's got standard papers there. So, mm. yeah, anyway, he's outside Selfridges. He's one of the newspaper sellers. Oh, yeah. Uh, before they went totally free. And, they just give and it away lost. now, don't they? Yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all given away. You uh, say. Messengers of Doom, this is titled. Yeah. And uh, I can't quite make out the headline on the newspaper, but the word drama is on it. Yeah. So, 
Uh, and there's some text that goes with these. And, and a lot of these pictures, by the way, would be, um, you know, some people would would criticize them. Would they say they were snapshots? Some people would say they're snapshots. Some people would say they're out of focus. Yeah. For example, well, that one is one that, here. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's out of focus. But within, a collect- it's within, within a collection of pictures, it takes on a whole different um, narrative, doesn't it? Yeah, and also remember, this is this is another thing to say about this kind of stuff, is that, uh, yes, that's motion blur, okay? Mm. Um, now, g- motion, getting motion blur and exposing it correctly when you're shooting film mm. is a lot easier than just getting it wrong on a digital camera and pretending you were trying to get motion blur. Yes. So there's a very big difference. He's, yes. You know, he's done that for a reason because it's people walking down the steps. It's meant to look like that. One of my favourite motion blur pictures at weddings, remember weddings, <laughs> um, is of the, um, and you, you've done this, and I know I've done this, is of the waiting staff coming out of the kitchens with all yeah. their plates. Yeah. Love that picture. But yeah. it's a hard one to get even in digital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To do it well. Uh, absolutely. It is the pan pan stuff, mm. yeah. Um, there's a there's a page here called Knees and the IRA London at War. It's t- it's titled and it's wow. a picture of um, a woman in one of the, the the kind of coffee shops in 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 um, Trafalgar Square, and you can see the difference there in terms of the the decor, and you can just about see her face, but she's reading the Evening Standard, um, and yeah. the title on there is IRA Gangs Two Escapes. Oh, um, so not only is it uh, photographic journey actually it's a trip down memory lane for those of us who who you know who were old enough to to kind of lived through the 80s and stuff and, and it's not a negative thing it's, this it's does a make you want to gra- grab your camera and go and do and go and do some street work doesn't it it's great i love it spot the lady street is this why you do street work because you want to you know you're you're creating you're curating your your own narrative like this for the future yeah i mean i love all of this stuff but the fact is it's much harder. But why is it um, harder to get these pictures? Because you, you because just, you can still make these. It's not illegal to make pictures in the street. It's not illegal to make pictures in the street, but it is much more difficult to be accepted doing it. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't really bother me so much, but uh, you know, I you can see in a lot of these pictures, mm. people looking at the camera, being he spotted the photographer. But right? actually, it would have been harder in that period. You could argue because not everybody had a camera. So if somebody came up to you and did a street photograph, you'd be thinking, "Hang on, matey, what's your what's your issue here?" Well, Whereas now, people are more used to camera cameras and are less likely to be offended by the use of one perhaps that's a very valid point but i think people these days are far more concerned about what you're going to do with it why are you taking my picture what am i going to get out of it you're going to put that on facebook i don't want my picture i'm you know that's the kind of stuff but wouldn't they have had similar thoughts then but they i mean there wouldn't have been a facebook etc around but they would certainly have thought they wouldn't have been well, worried about privacy what's, what's your problem mate oh i don't think so certainly I mean, on the underground who's that guy that did the underground pictures that you love bob mazer bob mazer yeah, but he he did it, didn't he? I mean, you know, it's there's there's no harm. I love that picture, yeah. Lady De Marie's ad, Lady Lady De Marie's adamant. Uh, you just had a pleasant lunchtime with a friend with a charming necklace and a dainty black hat for an a f- when for absolutely no reason whatsoever a man with a little black camera takes a photo. See that? that there that, you go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and what was their expression? Well, the, the guy's looking at him. The 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 lady isn't. She's she's got a packet of Marlboro Reds mm. and she's mm. puff, sticking one in her mouth. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. No, I get the point. I do get the point, but uh, different time, you, different challenge. Different time, different challenge. But the point, the point is, in those days, you, he could say, uh, "You know, I've taken your picture. Yeah. Thanks, whatever." Uh, there is no nowadays. There is so much that's going on in terms of privacy, whether it's right or wrong, and all of this stuff and everything, and it just makes it less fun, less enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would absolutely love to spend six months. You know, b- taking pictures. We've got it. Candid. You've got it. I've got it. Yeah, <laughs> candid pictures of people that wearing masks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, candid pictures uh, without the worry of uh, you know. You, you get a cracking picture, and uh, maybe you want to do a book, and then the editor says, you know, have you, "Where's the model release or whatever?" You know, because we yeah. want to use it for something other than that. Uh, the fun is is harder. The fun is harder. You know, and. Uh, that's that's the difficulty of it. You haven't stopped doing street work, though, have you? I know, I know that the street workshops are very um, th- th- that you love uh, doing. I know you enjoy that. I know you really enjoy the street work. I haven't stopped it. I mean, I've stopped everything yeah. <laughs> basically. But but no, I mean, I will I will get back to it. But it is, you know, the style that I like, which is mm. pure candid photography. Mm. Even other photographers these days are like, well, you what gives you the right to take a picture of somebody if they don't know they're taking a picture? Mm. And my answer is. 
because I have the right. Mm. I do have the right mm. to take that picture. I have ethical boundaries, but I do have the right. It's, there's not a question of who has the right. But it you're not adversarial, right. are you, when you go no, out? If somebody ever said to him, to you, um, can you d- delete that picture, what would you say? Um, well, it's never happened, right. but I would probably, first of all, discuss with them why I took it and you know, the reason behind it. Yeah. And, you know, you. I think what would be a really good idea for people, um, and this is something that's just popped into my head, is to take a book like this, stick this in your camera bag. That's, that's a really good idea. So when you're taking pictures yes. of the of the buskers and you're taking pictures of the people selling the Evening Standard yeah. and they say, you take my picture, say, yeah, actually I did. And, and the reason is because I want our gen- future generations to see pictures like this. This book would you. be perfect to take, actually. Yeah. You've just reminded me of something that I used to do at weddings, which we have mentioned on the show before. There were there were a couple of um, of registrars I, I used to meet reasonably regularly, and in the end I, I took an A4 I printed out an A4 sheet of uh, I think it was about six photos on it showing what I could get at a at a uh, at a ceremony if you would allow me just to do my job, mm. and I, I purposefully put on there six pretty high you know mm. um, mo- mo- moments of uh, you know in, in, intense you know there was there was. One picture was somebody crying, another one was a dad looking exceptionally proud over over the shoulder, and and there was all sorts of stuff like that. And I I used to take that to show registrars. Look, you know, I'd say, what can I do? They'd say, well, you need to stand over there. And say, oh, if I could just be there, I could get this, and it would uh. make so much difference. And it worked a few times. Yeah, I'm sure. I still have that A4 sheet with me. Yeah, I haven't had to use it for a long time. Obviously, not during the pandemic, but 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 attitudes were changing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and that's of course- a good idea. Take out a crib. Sh- uh, would it be a crib sheet? Well, I don't know. Sort of, just take well, a book, can yeah. you? But but I, anyway, I you know you, I don't know. It, it, it's just different, and mm. and people's generally people's personalities are different. And of course, you know people people say yeah, but people people are much worse. People are badder these days. Badder, and, and I think that's that's yes. just not true either. No. Um, but you know whatever. Anyway, this is Vintage Eighties <laughs> London Street Photography by Johnny Stiletto. Johnny Stiletto. Yeah, great, good stuff. That Francis Lincoln Limited Publishers. Yeah. Well done. Brilliant book. How much? How much was it? Well, was, you bought it a few years ago. Yeah, 15 quid. But I'm, sure, I'm fairly sure this is one that's still kicking around as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, should be easy to get hold yeah, of that. Yeah. Do you miss those days of going to shops and just sitting there for hours looking at books? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> World's End Shop. That's my favourite bookshop. Yeah. World's End. Leslie Burdett just had an idea here. It might take a bit of research, he said, but uh, would you consider mentioning a photo competition each that catches your eye attention each each episode, or even better, set a theme with a hashtag so we can submit images, maybe somewhere not in the main Fujicast timeline, where you pick out the winner for the first time, and then the winner picks the next winner, and then that winner picks the next winner, And that, which I thought was a really good idea. I'm mentioning it because it's kind of like a live meeting here. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe when the Fujicast at four thing um, eventually comes because that will come to a sort of um, a, a year anniversary and Neil Ford might think oh god that's done thank heavens oh, oh. yeah that's a good idea and we, we do have the Fujicast Instagram account that, yeah. that we do very little with oh we never mention that no because we don't do anything with it no but that would but be a good place that would for be it. a good place yeah. yeah so hashtag Fujicast well done Leslie you've just voted yourself into a job there there's no pay none at all none at all um, and that's it for this week. Thank you to uh, Ryan Katsanas, our guest, um, took us to uh, to Alcatraz. Fortunately, he didn't leave us there. Um, it's a fascinating place. I'd love to go. Mm. You've been four times, you said? Four times. Wow. Yep. Does it ever change for you when you go no, across? It's always the same. It's always the same. Yeah. Just, it's, what, does it feel, it. what For you, what does it feel like when you're I in love there? the history of it all, and yeah. I love... You know, I love being in the same rooms as some of these criminals slept in and stuff like that. I just love all that. Yeah. Do you get a funny feeling? Yeah. Do you? What sort of yeah. shiver kind of... No, no, just sort like... Sort of intense you, kind of... You, you cannot get much closer to to a his, you know, to a historical people yeah. than being in the rooms they were incarcerated in. You know, it's 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 like, you know, when you go to Shakespeare's house in, in Stratford yeah. and, and you go into the room that he, he kind yes. of died in or something, you know, yeah. whatever, and it's like, wow, that's that's... And you can imagine him in the bed dying... You know, it, right in front of you, kind of thing. I'd Do you rather never think about things like no, that. No, I'd probably would have thought about him sitting at the table writing the next masterpiece. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> didn't he die? Shakespeare died on his birthday, didn't he? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, for some reason, Elvis Presley's demise comes to mind. Oh, no. But that wasn't so nice. Yeah, but they, you see, and, that, and in the smallest room. That, that, and they've still got that toilet. Have they? Yeah, somewhere. Not it a great golden, golden really? one, wasn't it? Oh. I think. 
Anyway, on that note, thank you for, <laughs> very much for joining us this enjoy week. Enjoy your lunch. Yes, enjoy. Uh, if you'd like to send in a question, we're here for business every week. Click at fujicast.co.uk is the address, or you can send via the Facebook group. That's a good way. If you're one of our Patreons, thank you. We love you very, very much. And uh, we, we do try to bump your questions to the front as well. I know we haven't bumped everybody of late, but uh, we will. Um, so thank you to those that are supporting the show by Patreon. If you can share an episode on Twitter or on Facebook, you are an absolute star. Let us know where you're sharing because we, we can give those platforms a shout out as well. And we will uh, we will see you next week. Or oh, music from Blue Wednesday. So supporting music from the incredible artlist.io. I should mention that. We will see you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.